And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars, and welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. You know, with every passing day, I see the the signs of the end times, of the last days. And, and it's amazing to me how I read the Bible and I look at today's headlines and I can see a connection. <laughs> they seem to go together perfectly. You can hold the headlines of the newspapers in one hand and the Bible in the other and, well, you just begin to understand. Now, those who don't love Bible prophecy, who don't know anything about it, I think are very, very confused and unhappy. They don't know where their life is taking them. They don't understand why God cares about the people of this earth. And they don't know about their destiny. You know, destiny is a very important thing. Destiny is not luck or chance. Destiny is a given fact or truth. You have a destiny. I have one, and so does every person on this earth. And destiny is something that cannot be changed. In the book of Daniel, we find that these things, the, the book of the prophet Daniel says, these prophecies are determined in advance. You know, I got several letters in the past, and the the individuals are very intelligent and intellectual, and they, they tell me, well, Bible prophecy may say this or that, but we can change it if we're determined. If man says, we will not have this, we will, you know, <laughs> we will do better than this, we can establish a, a great system of justice and peace and harmony and I, and I tell them, it doesn't matter what you do, it's what has already been determined. There is a destiny. And they look at me, <laughs> these gentlemen with big eyes, and say, but we can change destiny. No, no, you, you cannot change destiny. <laughs> you better get in line with it and understand it and know where it's going to take you. And this is ultimately important. Now, I want to talk to you today about a document that has made history from the day it was first discovered. No one seems to know the author of it. It's, it's not signed by anybody, this document. But this document has traversed, it has gone around the world. And it has caused revolutions and I mean, it's <laughs> the Jews say this is the most troublesome document ever printed. And they have done much to try to ban it from off the face of the earth. Now, some years ago, I came upon this document. I read it. I think I understood it. I needed God's help, of course. I needed the Bible to fully understand it, but eventually I did understand it. And I said to my wife one day, I said, I must publish this because it's only in these these silly little editions that, that are really not even accurate. I must get the book in its entirety and publish it as a real book. And I did, and it's been published ever since. And the title of it is The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. And on the front cover at the top, I put the words, the classic on international Zionism. This, in fact, is the prescription. It is the agenda of the Jews. But not every Jew. There is an upper class of which most Jews know little about. There is an upper class of Jews who are rabbis, 
who have power and wealth and influence, and they have sought to make the words of the protocols of the learned elders of Zion come true. This for them is destiny. And when this upper class also discovered that their plans, their prescription, their blueprint, their plan of destiny would be known to the world, went forth to destroy it. And throughout the world, there have been people caught with a copy of this book who have forfeited their lives, forfeited their very lives for simply having a copy of it. I think we need to look at this book, Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, and we need to chart the history of the book. I believe in charting the history of this book, you will know the direction that the world has taken since this book was first published in 1901 in Russia, and from that date it's gone out to the world, and we now have it in the United States because Power of Prophecy Ministries has published it again. Oh, my. Oh, my, the World Jewish Congress, the World Zionist Congress, uh, and so many others, the Jewish ADL, are angry, angry. I can only explain to you that I am alive today after publishing this book for so many years. I am only alive today because of the hand of God. The hand of God has sustained me. If it were not for God, I would have been snuffed out long ago. People write and say, Tex, why haven't you been killed? Why are you still alive? And I can only answer, God. God. Many of my friends, many much less lesser and many greater men than me have died because of the secrets that they have known. This, however, has become an open secret, and it is not believed by the majority of men because of the Jews. The Jews say this is a forgery. It's a hoax. But if it is a forgery, it's a very cleverly designed forgery. If it is a hoax, why has it motivated men throughout the world to do its bidding? In fact, my friends, the Jews have done the bidding of this since the date of its publication. Even before that, of course, it was available from 1896. 1896. But it was first published and put into the world in 1901 in Russia. By very fortuitous circumstances. And since that date it has flown. But I want to tell you about the people that first published it. You see, there was a man named Sergius Nilus, N-I-L-U-S, who was a Russian monk, a pastor. A pastor. He was a poor man who lived in Russia and had a small apartment in a monastery. And he was very concerned about Bible prophecy. Now, people don't understand this. But you see, God has made Bible prophecy of great concern to his people. Now, I know the pastors of today don't even talk about Bible prophecy. They don't understand it. They shy away from it. And they give you all kind of homilies and, you know, and, and, and fun sermons and, you know, nice, fancy uh, social calendar events in these churches. But they're frightened of Bible prophecy. And they see all of the symbols and the, the, the incredible things in the book of Revelation and uh, the book of Daniel and so forth. And they don't want to talk about those things. They don't understand them. But friends, you don't have to be like your pastors. You can know 
In fact, the book of Daniel says you will know if you know Jesus Christ. It says the wise shall understand, but the wicked shall not. Are you wise? I'm not talking about having a Ph.D. or beyond it. I'm not talking about even a high school diploma. I'm not talking about education at all. I'm talking about the wisdom that God can give you. Are you wise? Somebody said to me, what church do you go to, Tex, many years ago? And I told them the church. And they said, well, you know, that's a good church, but I like to go to this other church. Because the church where I go to, there's so many wise men. There's so many intellectuals. There's so many college professors. We have doctors. We have lawyers. It's a great church. I learned so much from these other men. And I <laughs> I responded, well, my church does not have those great men. My church does not have lawyers and doctors and men with letters behind their names. My church just has simple people. Simple men and women. Men who pray. Men who you go to with problems. Who can answer. Who know what God has for you. It's those men that I appreciate and I Listen to when I'm in trouble, when I need direction. One time a man came to me. He said, I, I had a terrible, terrible problem. I was in the New Age movement, the occult. And my wife had left me because she had a spirit guide who told her she did not have her soul mate and she was to go get her soulmate, and so she went with another man and began to have an affair, and he was her soulmate, and she left me and our kids, and I'm all alone now, and I'm a, I've got a doctorate degree, and I started going to church, but no one there was able to tell me what to do, where to go. I was so miserable. And then he said one day, a friend said to me, I know just what you need. There is a gentleman who works at a certain mechanic shop who fixes the engines and other things on automobiles. But he's most of all a motorcycle mechanic. And he loves to work on motorcycles. He can help you. And this man said, what can a motorcycle mechanic do for me? I'm a doctor. And his friend said, go see him. He knows Jesus Christ. And suddenly my, my, my friend, this doctor, said to himself, this is important. This motorcycle mechanic knows Jesus Christ. He said, I don't know anybody in the churches I've gone to that know Jesus Christ, that know him. So he went. He dressed in his nicest suit and his nicest tie and shoes and so forth. And he, he went to that motorcycle shop and he asked the man who owned it. He said, is, is, you know, so and so here. And he's, yes, he's right over there. And he looked and there was a man. Very, very dirty with grease on his hands and he had grease on his face and he had been working very much on the motorcycles. He says, is that the man? He said, yes, that's him. And he went to him and he said, sir, do you have just a moment for me? And the man said, well, yes, I, 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 I tried to. I'm busy on this motorcycle I'm working on. He said, but, but you've got to help me because you know Jesus. And immediately the motorcycle mechanic stopped what he was doing. He said, let's walk outside around the building here for a moment and talk. And he went with the man 
And he said, I can tell you're in a lot of trouble. And the well-dressed doctor, who's a friend of mine, who told me this story, said, I broke down in tears and I told him I'm in the most tragic situation. I'm ready to kill myself. I must have help. He says, well, you don't have any problem that other people don't have, that Jesus didn't fix. He says, let me pray with you just a minute. And there they were on the street corner with cars going by, this dirty mechanic and this well-dressed businessman with all of his suit and so forth. And he prayed and he accepted Jesus Christ and his problem evaporated. Now, I'm not going to tell you how he solved that problem. I'm just going to tell you it evaporated. He had no problem at all. That, my friends, is a true story. Now, the protocols of the learned elders of Zion are something that probably have gotten me in a little bit of trouble over the years. I guess I'm a little bit like that motorcycle mechanic, maybe not as, as much of a great man as he was, of course. But I read this book, and I want to know what God tells me from this book. And God tells me this is a book of the serpent. Now, I want to explain that to you. You see, the first time I read this, I didn't understand it, but it talks about a serpent in this book. And everybody who has bought this book from the ministry, almost nobody comes back to me and says, Tex, that part about the serpent was very interesting. Now, I want to tell you about this, friends. This is the key. This is the key to this entire document. If you understand nothing else today, I'm going to chart the history of the serpent, the symbolic snake or serpent of Judaism. And it's attempted and possible of future destiny takeover of the world. I'm going to tell you about this same serpent that came to Jesus Christ and said to him, I will give you all the cities of earth. Look at what I can give to you. And he gave him a great vision of power and of majesty and said, I own all these. I own the whole world. I can give it to you. Now, that's in the Bible. Some people say, oh, well, he's a liar. He didn't own anything. Oh, yes, he did. He still owns this world. He, he is God of this world, small g, always a small g. He is God of this world. He can give, to, give it to whomever he wants, and he has done it many times. He gave it to Stalin he gave it to Lenin. He gave it to Hitler. He will give this earth and his kingdoms to anybody he wants. But Jesus didn't want it. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Get behind me. <laughs> you don't deserve to be in front of me. Get behind me. Don't try to tempt the Lord thy God. And Satan stopped that foolishness. But it was wisdom, according to the world. It was wise. And that's why this is written by the wise men, the learned elders of Zion. Now, they have a number. They actually have a number behind their name. It's 33. 33. The protocols of the learned elders of Zion, 33. What does that 33 stand for? That is the highest number in Freemasonry, Scottish Rite Freemasonry, the largest Masonic Society or fraternity in the world, 33 is the number. That tells you right away it's not only by Jews but by Masons. This fact has escaped the attention of the world for many years. It's by Masonic Jews. It's the Masonic Jews who have brought tragedy, death, horror to the world. They began to operate the, uh, the first years of the uh, 20th century when the Jews took over Turkey and caused the Turks to murder the Armenian Christians. And over a million Armenians were slaughtered. The Armenian Genocide. You can read about that in your history books. But a few short years later, 
the Jews took over Russia and uh, gave it communism. And then they began to kill the Christians and the, the good people of Russia. And some, according to Solzhenitsyn, America, uh, the, the world's greatest historian, I believe, in the 20th century, he was called the conscience of the 20th century. They killed 66 million. Now, friends, if you were to go about killing 66 million people, I promise you, you would never finish. It would take you forever and ever, and then there would be more born to them. An incredible number of people murdered, savaged by the Jews who were Masons. I have pictures in my book, Codex Magica, showing you Joseph Stalin standing erect with his hand hidden under his coat, giving the Masonic sign of the hidden hand. He was a Freemason. Of course he was a Freemason. They're all Masons who do these horrible acts because the Masons are secretly Jews. Now, they're not Jewish in blood, but they have put themselves in with the Jews by their own desire and will. Now, in the Bible, there is a group mentioned by God. And he mentions this same group twice in Revelation 2. You may want to read it for yourself. He says, there are those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, there are many who say they're Jews. You know, there's been a big controversy recently. People say to me, well, you know, there are some people who don't believe your book text. You wrote a book. I wrote a book entitled DNA Science and the Jewish Bloodline. I say the Jews are really not Jews. They come from Khazaria. And I tell you where Khazaria was, a European country. And the vast majority of Jews are not Jews. But, listen to me, but are the synagogue of Satan. And people try to, to get uh, false DNA reports and so forth and false historical reports. They say, oh, no, 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 no. The Jews are really Jews. Now, people who especially hate the Jews, and no Christian can hate the Jews. No Christian can hate anyone. But they, those who hate the Jews want the Jews to remain a people, a unified one race of people. But I want to explain to you, my friends, the Jews are not Jews. They're whoever says they're Jews and makes themselves out to be Jews. You see, because the tongue, the Bible says, is a mighty instrument. Whatever you say, you will get. If you say, I do not believe in God, then God will disregard you. If you call on the name Jesus, you will be saved. But if you do not call on him, if you denounce him, then he will denounce you. If you call on him and confess him that he is Lord and Savior, he will confess that you're his child and you have been adopted. He is your father in heaven. He will confess you before the angels in heaven. Ah, the tongue is a mighty instrument, my friends. It has the ability to damn you or to save you. Your own tongue. And many of these people say, I am a Jew. Then they become a Jew. I don't care what race they are. I, I, it doesn't matter to me what nation they came from. I wrote this book only for, from interest to show people how silly it is. And the Apostle Paul says that genealogies, the study of genealogies is foolishness. You say, Tex, you can't believe that. Oh, oh, listen, I know Black Lives Matter and all this, this silly garbage that's out there. And these black men are killing policemen and they're stupid and they're evil. And, 
and, and sometimes the, 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 the whites uh, react in vengeance, and they're stupid. Because God doesn't care what race you are. And that's why he says these people say they're Jews. In other words, they say they're Jews. They're, they're, they're saying that they're good people, righteous people, pious people, but they're not. I'm a Jew. I'm so superior. I'm so religious. I, I have the true God on my side. No, you don't. You say you're a Jew, but you're not. But what you are is the synagogue of Satan. Now, these people of the 33rd degree who wrote this book originally, this manuscript, this document, Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, have made themselves out to be Jews. And they're of the synagogue of Satan. You know, here's what the Bible, excuse me, the, not the Bible, the Talmud, the Talmud says that favors the Jews. In the book of Baba Mesia, paragraph 114.6, it says this to the Jews. Oh, it, it makes them feel so good. It, it makes them feel so special. It says, you are human beings, but the nations of the world are not human beings, but are beasts. Wow. If you're a Jew, you're a human being. In fact, you're a god. But if you're of some other nation, if you're uh, American or German or Italian or Mexican or whatever, you're just a beast. Really? That's what the Talmud says. That's their holy book. Hmm. And it's an amazing thing. The Talmud must be correct because it says also in the tract Makila that God in heaven has to study the Talmud. He has to study it to keep current. <laughs> it says Jehovah himself in heaven studies the Talmud. The rabbis are better than God, you see. In fact, the Talmud it, it has a, a story of a, a rabbi who disputed with God, and then he got out the Talmud and said, "He, see, you're wrong. Here it is in the Talmud. And God said, you're right. I'm wrong. May the Talmud be blessed. <laughs> the Talmud knows more than God, of course, because these people are the learned elders of Zion. And they have to be right. And you're just a beast for not understanding. Well, let me explain how these protocols came about. You see, Neelus was just a poor priest. But one of the women of his church was Mademoiselle Glinka. I call her Mademoiselle because she had traveled to Paris, France. And that's what they called her there. And while she was in Paris, France, studying, she was a very powerful woman. She was a member of aristocracy in uh, Russia at the time. A man came to her, a certain Freemason of the Paris Grand Orient Lodge, and said, I have a document for you and for Russia, but I must charge you $2,500 for it. That was a fantastic sum of money at the time. You could buy a house or an automobile with that. But she read the document and she paid it. She paid every cent. She was a rich aristocrat, you see. And Mademoiselle Glinka came to Russia with this document in her hand. And she told Sergius Nilas, this poor monk, I want you to have this book. She said, God has told me you will know what to do with it. And he did. And I'll tell you exactly what Mr. Nilas or Brother Nilas did with this book. On the other side. I'm Tex Mars. You're listening to Power of Prophecy. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this brief message. Hello, friends. Tex Mars here again. I hope you'll order this book, Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. If you already have a copy, how about ordering a copy for a friend? In fact, how about ordering a copy? If you've got a local pastor, how about ordering a copy for him? Now, don't let him throw it back at you and say, I don't want this book. Well, 
Tell him to read it. Study it a while. Now, if the man says, oh, this is a terrible book. The Jews are trying to ban this book because it's so evil. It's so anti-Semitic. Say, well, read it for yourself. Why do you have to believe somebody else? But if it is anti-Semite, you're a smart man. You'll know it, won't you? Mm Mm-hmm. You see, read it for yourself. You'll understand. You'll know. What have they got to lose? Nothing. And they might have a lot to gain. I've read this book. And the more I read about Jews, and by the way, I've written, uh, let's see, four or five books recently about the Jews. I published Holy Serpent of the Jews. I'm going to talk more about the serpent and the protocols in just a moment. But I wrote an entire book called Holy Serpent of the Jews. And then I wrote another book about the Jews entitled The Destroyer. The Destroyer. Hmm. And then my newest book, which will be out in maybe three or four weeks, please wait to order it to announce it here on the radio or you see it in our newsletter or online at, on our website, powerofprophecy.com. It's entitled The Feast of the Beast. The Feast of the Beast. Hmm, interesting title about the Jews. But all of these books are right in line with the protocols. Because the protocols is right in line with the Holy Bible. It tells you the events of the last days. Henry Ford, the great industrialist, wrote much about the Jews. In fact, he was hated by Jews because he simply wrote the truth. He said about the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, which he read. He said, I've read it. And he said, I don't know whether it's true or not. I simply know that the events and the statements in the book are perfectly in line with history. Now, I'm paraphrasing Mr. Ford. He was a powerful man, a rich man, a a man who was putting out a lot of Ford automobiles. He's he's been given credit for uh, inventing and developing the assembly line, putting out those cars. He made it possible for the poor to have cars across the roads of America. And he said, these are perfectly in line with history, these protocols. How could they be so perfect in line with history? That was in 1920 when he said that. Now it's 2020 almost, 2017. Almost 100 years have gone by since Henry Ford said that. I'm here to tell you today that over the last 100 years, they still are in line with history. And I can show you where the events of today, as Donald Trump is inaugurated as president, fit exactly with the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. If you wanted to know history, just read the protocols of Zion. That's an astonishing thing. How could history be known in advance? Wow. Maybe God caused this book to be written. Maybe God caused it to be published. Maybe God wants it in your hands, my friends, perhaps. Now, we offer this book, The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. Just ask for the Protocols book, The Protocols, for $20, $20. And please add $5 shipping and handling. And say, I like that protocols book. I want to see what it says for myself. The Jews at the top say it's evil. It's anti-Semite. But I want to see for myself. Hmm. You might be blessed. You know, the the Bible talks about a, a, a people who lived in Berea, a city back in Paul's day. It says the people of Berea were more spiritual they were more spiritual and learned than other people why because they studied it for themselves that's how they knew that paul was truly an apostle they studied the word of god and said i want to see for myself they didn't just listen to him and say okay they didn't no they they didn't fall for it they didn't fall for some fake 
They said, we will go to the word of God and see whether these things are so. I challenge you, my friends, go to the word of God and see whether these things are so. See whether this is indeed the synagogue of Satan with its duplicity, with its cunning, with its evil, with its planning, with its scheme for world domination. Find out for yourself. Then ask God, God, is this true? Is this true? If he tells you it is, well, who cares what other people say? $20, $5 shipping and handling. Ask for the book protocols. You can get it by phoning us toll free, 1-800-234-9673. Or you can write to us and say, give me that book text. I want that book. Okay. (laughs) $25, that'll take your shipping and handling. And our uh, address here is 1708. Patterson, P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N, Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. Now you can go to our website, powerofprophecy.com or texmars.com. Now let's return to our regular program. We're talking about the protocols today. We're talking about how you can chart history with the protocols. Now, on page 152 of this edition of this book, it tells you about a reference in the protocols to what is called the snake of Judaism, the symbolic snake. Now, Nilus, the monk who printed this book, told us that there was a scheme throughout history for a conquest of the whole universe. The conquest of the universe by the serpent. Have you ever heard of a serpent, my friend, called Ouroboros, the circular serpent? It's the the serpent who is in a circle, and he he has grabbed his own tail with his mouth, with his teeth. You may see that in a number of occult books. It's known way, way back in history in ancient Egypt and Babylon, in Sumeria, in Chaldea. And all the way through the Middle Ages, as the occult world studied the satanic doctrines, they all knew of the serpent. And they gave him a motto, as above, so below. Because the serpent, you see, was in a circle. Now, what does this indicate? It indicates that the serpent intends to... Gobble up, you might say, the entire world. And then he'll even go further. He'll try to gobble his own tail. And he ends up in a circle after conquering the whole world. This is a great serpent. It's a great sea serpent. His name in the Jewish doctrines is Leviathan. Now, I came upon Leviathan in books by Jewish rabbis recently. They say that Leviathan is their Messiah. What, you, you, you ask? What? Leviathan, the serpent, is the Messiah of Israel? Oh, you've heard about the Messiah who didn't come. It wasn't Jesus, they say. He's the false Messiah. But the Jews say our Messiah is yet to come. But he's also here with us. He watches over us. He guides us the Messiah of the Jews. Who could that be? Ask the rabbis. They will not tell you because you're a goy. You're a Gentile. But go study it for yourself. In fact, why don't you get my books? I quote the rabbis. You don't have to go to every rabbi. Just go to my books. Go to Tex Morris' book. Go to the book, The Holy Serpent of of the Jews. I quote all the rabbis. I make it easy for you, you see. You don't need to study for yourself. You could. In fact, I give you all the references. You can study them yourself if you'd like. But you'll see that I have accurately quoted all these rabbis, and they tell you who their serpent is. His name is Leviathan. And you find that he is their Messiah. He is their guide. He is their spiritual instructor. And many of the Jews, because they do not believe in the God of the universe, whose name is Jesus, they pray to the serpent. You say, Tex, that's just, uh, that's just incredible. Well, it's true. And 
it's interesting, these rabbis today, and I'm talking about the rabbis of yesterday and the rabbis of today, the greatest rabbis in the world, even the chief rabbis of Israel and of Rome, will tell you that they believe in Leviathan. In fact, they actually believe in what is called the Feast of Leviathan. Now, I, I, I was talking with a good friend the other day, and I was telling him about this, and he said, I don't believe that. I don't believe the Jews really worship the serpent. I said, oh, yes, they're going to have a big feast to the serpent, the Feast of Leviathan. I said, you've heard about the marriage supper of the Lamb where all of the Christians have a symbolic a uh, 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 huge uh, banquet, and Jesus is there, and, and we're all there in our white robes, and it's just going to be a marvelous thing to be in heaven and at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And But they don't believe in that, of course, but the Jews say we will have our own banquet. We will be married to the serpent. We will have a feast of Leviathan. And my friend said, that's impossible. I said, well, now we have something called the computer. Now we have a search engine called Google. Why don't you look it up? Before you couldn't look it up, you'd have to go to all these rabbis' books. But now you can look it up. Go, go to Google. And by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging you also. Go to Google and Google up Feast of Leviathan. And there you'll find the Jewish feast. In fact, they consume the serpent at the feast of Leviathan, they claim. How can you consume the serpent? Oh, it's just like communion. You see, some Christians believe that, that when you take communion, you're re- literally taking the real presence, the, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. The Jews believe that at their great feast of Leviathan, they're going to be consuming the body and blood of the beast whose name is Leviathan. Look it up. Look it up. <laughs> now, the Jews would prefer that a Gentile named Tex Mars never discover this. How could he have discovered what the Feast of Leviathan was? And even if it is in, in uh, online in our computers on Google, no, no, no Gentile knows what it means. They don't understand it. That's my job, friends. God has given me a job. Do you have a job? Maybe to paint a house. Maybe to prepare a law brief. Might be to operate on somebody's heart. Or it might be to wash dishes. But you've got to do your job. And if you're proud of that job, you're going to do it right, no matter what it is. That's what I do. I do it right. I study it. (laughs) I do it right. That's why I write these books. But people don't know that, and they think Tex Mars is adult. Well, okay. I'm adult, but I still work for God. (laughs) Even adults have a job to do, (laughs) and I have my job. Now, Monk Nelas was given this book, this manuscript, and he read it, and he God told him this is important. This is the Story. You see, he was at that moment writing his own prof- prophecy book. That's how God works. This was in 1901. He was writing a book. He had entitled it The Great Within the Small. I don't know what, what that means. I've never read Neilis' entire book. But I know that what Neilis did was he took this small manuscript, The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. He said, this is important. This explains what's going to happen. Listen to this now. He said, this is going to explain what is going to happen to my country. Now, what if you had come upon a book, a small manuscript, which said these things are going to happen to the United States of America over the next 12 or 13 years? What if you came upon a book today like that? Would you be surprised? Would you be upset or angry? Would you be consider it fantasy? Would you want to get that story out to others? Would you be so upset about it? You say, I've got to tell people what's going to happen to my country. Because 
Sergius Nilus, seeing the importance of this book, in 1901 published it as an appendix. That's the back of his book, The Great Within the Small, which, by the way, nobody thought would be much of a book anyway. Sort of like my one of my first Christian books, Dark Secrets of the New Age. The publisher said, oh, it may sell a couple thousand copies. I told him, I said, well, I, I don't know. God's told me it's going to sell a lot more than that. Well, yeah, everybody thinks their book's going to sell. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he told me later it sold 5,000 copies the first week and kept expanding and selling and selling and selling. My book became an international bestseller. Well, God knew more than he did, obviously. And yet he was one of the greatest editors in Christian publishing at the time. Now, Nilos published this book because he saw that it was what it, it explained what was going to happen to his country. And, and he published it in 1901 and just and just 16 years later, 16 years later, the communist Jews took over Russia and Moscow. And they commenced a program of murder. And they murdered. And they shed blood. And they tortured. And they savaged. And they raped. And they killed. And Sergius Nilus had prophesied it all. He, he said in his book, The Great Within the Small, this book will explain to you what's going to happen to our country. And he went around to others and he said, please, please listen to me. Our country only has a few years. And then Satan himself is going to come. And he's going to kill so many. Please. But they didn't believe him. They said the czar actually read his book and then closed it up. He couldn't believe it either. But in 1917, the czar died. He was murdered. He and his old family. Sergius Nilus knew. Sergius Nilus knew that's what the protocols of the learned elders of Zion had told him. Your own country, Russia, is going to die. And it did. That's why Henry Ford said in 1920, just three years later, this tells history. And that's why I'm telling you today, this told what would happen in communist Russia because so many things are in the book about banking about how they control the money system, about how the Jews are able to, to, to raise up uh, generations of revolutionaries and they will take over a country. What do you think is happening in America today? Millions of people demonstrating out on the streets. They're crazies, aren't they? They're Hollywood stars. They're, 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 they're Jewish nuts and they're just crazy people. They're all a bunch of lesbians and homosexuals and and abortionist. And they hate Christians particularly. They love Islam only because Islam is the enemy of Christianity. I was recently reading where a well-known movie star has become a Muslim. And she said, I became a Muslim because, my, because Islam hates Christianity. Ha, ha, ha. Is that why you became a Muslim? That's what she says. I was recently reading where Meryl Streep was asked about Islam, the Muslim faith. She said, it's a wonderful faith. It's a, a faith of peace and justice. But she was asked, well, what about all the kids they're killing and, and all the horrible things they're doing and the, the monstrous acts of murder that they're doing in the Middle East? And she looked like, oh, I don't believe that. Islam is a religion of peace. And she said, I would rather be a Muslim than a Christian. She prefers Islam to Christianity. Oh, yes. Meryl Streep. Now, Nilus put this in his book. And the book flew. And his book was then, was, 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 it found its way into Great Britain and back to France and, and into Greece and to other countries. And finally to the United States of America. But as for Mr. Nilus, I'd like to tell you what happened to him. In 1917, the
the, the communists took over, the Jews, and they immediately sought the publisher of this book, The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, and they arrested him. And he was put on trial. What was his crime? They said he had committed a horrible travesty against the state. They said, your book has done more damage than any other book ever published. For publishing a book, he went to prison. He went to the gulag. And he spent 12 long years in the gulag. He was already an old man. And there they put him to work in the fields and, 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 and digging ditches and carrying used rocks. And he, he, he finally came out of the gulag after 12 years, a broken man. A broken man in body, but not in spirit, because Sergius Nilus had seen the truth. He had seen what God would do. He knew of the power of Satan, but he also knew of the wonder and the majesty of God. Sergius Nilus is one of Christianity's greatest heroes, but you won't hear about him today. You won't read about Sergius Nilus in any Christian book. There's no Christian bookstore that has the story of Sergius Nilus in it. What I have just told you about Mr. Nilus is published nowhere because he is the hated author or publisher, that is, of the learned elders of Zion, the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. Now, I suppose someday somebody will walk past my grave, and if they pay attention at all to the name Tex Mars on it, they may say he's that horrible anti-Semite who published that book, the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. But I believe that Sergius Nilus has been announced in heaven. I believe that he, 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 he was a broken man, but not in spirit. And he spent his last years back in, in that same monastery. His book, of course, was not published anymore. His book had been banned in Russia by the state. They said he did such damage that he had to spend 12 years in a Russian prison gulag. Now, this book is so powerful. It's, it's so meaningful. I want to tell you just a little bit about it. It talks about the press, the power of the press. And these uh, Jews who wrote this book said, when we are angry, we stir up the press. We cause the press to attack our enemies. Is that not what they do today? Whatever Donald Trump says, the press contradict him. They hate him. And who owns the press? Well, they said in the protocols, they own the press. Is that true? Well, yes, it is. They own the press. Almost every huge publication, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times is owned by the Jews. 19 of 20 newspapers in America are owned by the Jews. And they say whatever they want. You know, people have told me, well, text your book is not going to be in bookstores anymore. Your first books were, but these new ones, they can't be because they talk about the Jews. Well, you're not going to make the money you used to make. Well, I never spent the money on myself, really. I spent it on this ministry. And you know what? We're still here. We're still here. And we're still publishing these books. I'm very fortunate. I, I, I'm not in prison. And, of course, they keep making laws and they keep working harder and harder, the press, to destroy us. And they have now what they call Fake news, you know. Fake news is everywhere. That's what the protocols say. We have fake news outlets. And we can flood any area with our news, our news. And they do. And they say at any time we can cause the people to riot and demonstrate. 
Well, what do you think, Mr. Soros? What, what, what religion is he now? Isn't he a Jew from Hungary? And he, and he, and he spends his millions of dollars in America to influence the people. And what do they do? They pay the demonstrators to go out and demonstrate. When the people went into the, the meeting houses where uh, Donald Trump was going to meet running for president in his campaign, they were, they were always met with demonstrators. But the demonstrators were bussed in from other cities. Well, who, who, who told the demonstrators to come there? Well, they were paid demonstrators. Paid to be there. To beat up Trump supporters. And then they would cry out, Trump is causing all these riots. He's the troublemaker. Hmm. That's the workings of the protocols. When you see these kind of things happening, these demonstrations that beat up people and cause violence, and then blame it on the people who get beat up, says, oh, they caused it. They provoked it. They're responsible. Friends, you know, you know that this is the protocols. These are the same people who gave us the protocols. And by the way, I might mention that Mademoiselle Glinka, she was put in prison too. Oh, she was the horrid person who had brought the protocols from Paris, France. How did they get to France? The protocols supposedly came out of the World Zionist Congress that was held in Basel, Switzerland in 1896. And there is where Theodore Herzl stood before the crowd and said, we must reestablish the nation of Israel today in the Middle East. Hmm. And they did. They said, we must cause a revolution of the people. And they did. And you know, some people say, well, communism is over. There's, there's no more communism today. We have Putin and, and, and we have democracy in, in Russia. Watch out, folks. It can be undone at any time. And maybe what happened in Russia will now happen in the United States of America. You say that, that can't be because for over 200 years we have been a free nation. Yeah, for, that's right. We have been. But look at what is going on today. Look at the horrors. And, and you see that, that a good one half the people are just crazy. They're insane. They're pro-homosexual marriage. They're pro-abortion, the killing of little babies. And, and, and they're pro-sex. I mean, anything goes now. And to say F-U-C-K is, is nothing. That's a, that's a word that comes out of their mouth like water. The horrors that we see today everywhere, everywhere show us how quick communism can take over a country. I recommend you read the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. See what happened in other countries and see what the plan is, what they're able to do to, 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 to own the money system, the press, and to control us. And see that our only hope, our only way out is Jesus Christ. Our only way out. And what a marvelous way that is, my friends. What a great highway to victory. That is to travel. I'm Tex Mars. It's been great being with you today. We've been looking at the protocols of the learned elders of Zion and studying more about it, discovering more about it. I'll be back again next week. And my friends, tune in each week during the same time and discover the power of prophecy.